out that there has been some advances over the last 100 years since the germ theory was, was put into practice. We have electronic medical records, and there's a big push for it to become useful. But they're not meaningful if it's based on the wrong taxonomy and the wrong description of diseases. How can it become more meaningful if you get it faster? We look at the evidence-based medicine, and there's an effort here to look at evidence-based medicine. The problem is, is that evidence-based medicine is really just a medical literacy exercise where you look at multiple studies that were done over the last 10 years based on earlier studies and ideas that are 20 or 30 years old, and you hope to find that there is some factor in large populations that apply to a subset of patients very accurately. But what we see in clinical practice is that for complex diseases, the typical patient that these guidelines are, are designed to provide guidance don't apply. And so most of medicine is guesswork and symptomatic treatment, and we do not get insight with evidence-based medicine. Now, I was very excited when the genome-wide association uh, came out, because here we could systematically look at every region of the human genome and hopefully find the gene that causes one factor or another. The problem was is that when you start doing multiple testing, as suggested by the scientific method in the germ theory of disease, you have to adjust for uh, random associations, and uh, that's called a Bonfiore correction. So it turns out that if you're going to look at a million variants, you need tens of thousands of patients, and then you have to repeat it just to make sure it wasn't by accident. And so you end up with massive studies with a few polymorphisms that are highly significant but have almost no effect on the patient. The problem is even worse with next generation sequencing where you end up with billions of variants per person and the data is just unmanageable and even to do a simple evaluation with uh, next generation sequencing it's a huge problem. And so we talk about how we can someday have a $1,000 human genome, but what they don't tell you is the $100,000 evaluation to try to sort it out. And it takes months, and then you get gibberish back and have to go back and resequence uh, the areas that uh, you suspect are abnormal. And so what we're finding is that exciting new technology fails in the wrong paradigm. So what progress have we made in treating pancreatic diseases over the last 10,000 years? Well, in the germ, germ theory, we have inflammation and all the features of long-standing inflammation without infection. And what have we learned? Well, we can tell you that there is scarring that occurs in some patients and not others, sometimes rapidly, sometimes slowing, maldigestion that sometimes occurs but not always, diabetes mellitus that sometimes occurs but not always, pain that can be intermittent, it can be constant, it can be mild, it can be severe, and 15 to 20 percent of patients never have pain at all. And you look at their pancreas and they say, you must be suffering. They said, well, I have a little bit of diarrhea, but I don't have any abdominal pain. And you say, that can't be true because I have a CAT scan that proves you're in pain. And we have a paper in press now where we've looked at our patients where we very carefully measured pain and graded the amount of fibrosis. And the correlation is, there is no correlation. And then we have a risk of pancreatic cancer, and we'll learn more about that later. So the diagnosis and treatment. The diagnosis requires demonstration of irreversible damage, and we do it by doing repeated CAT scans, MRIs, ERCPs, endoscopic ultrasound, blood tests, and what we're doing is we're looking for irreversible damage. 
That is the diagnosis. It, the diagnosis is you have something that's hopeless. But it doesn't tell you where it came from or why. And our treatment has been symptomatic with uh, treatment of pain, pancreatic enzymes, and insulin. So what we have is a hopeless, irreversible condition that's expensive to diagnose and treat. This was summarized in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I look to for guidance and insight, and the brilliant scientists from Harvard have come together, and they gave us this insight, which summarizes 10,000 years of trial and error and germ theory and addition of new 20th century technology. Chronic pancreatitis remains an enigmatic process of uncertain pathogenesis, unpredictable clinical course, and unclear treatment. The germ theory has failed. The germ theory has failed. We need a new paradigm and a new way of thinking of these diseases. So we've been able to map out these uh, diseases. This is hereditary pancreatitis. And what we see is that even though everybody has the identical same risk factor, the age of onset is variable for more than 20 years. Only a small I mean, a subset of patients develop maldigestion early. Some never develop it. Diabetes comes in some people, but not all of them. Pancreatic cancer comes late in some people, but not all of them. Yet they have all the same gene. It's, it's even unpredictable. If you know the worst, highest penetrant gene, it's still unpredictable on what's going to happen to that patient. So the problem is that the uh, disease is defined by the end-stage pathology, not by the etiology. Traditional methods to find the underlying cause have failed because you can't triangulate to zero in on hundreds of factors. You can just zero in on one factor. Similar dilemmas exist in other organs, and this is bankrupting the United States. Nine chronic diseases cost almost 80% of the health care dollars, more than $1.5 trillion a year, and they're not getting better. It's symptomatic and failed treatment, and it's the same thing. It's complex diseases. So we need a new paradigm. So the new paradigm is personalized medicine. The question is, what is it, and what does it replace? Well, 20th century medicine, personalized medicine, is needed when a syndrome is complex. If you have an infectious disease, you can use the germ theory of disease. If you have a complex syndrome, you need to use personalized medicine. This is when you have multiple etiologies with the same pathology, or the same pathology and multiple outcomes, and where the treatment effects are unpredictable. Now, for those of you who are clinicians, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is 90% of your practice. It's needed for functional disorders and cancers as well. And I'm beginning to believe that chronic pancreatitis is a functional disorder with a pathologic outcome. We focus instead on the mechanism instead of associations. So uh, the associations tell you something, but what we really want is the underlying mechanism. Personalized medicine relies on disease modeling and simulation not classification. And the reason is modeling allows you to look at the effect of any combination of multiple variables on a time-dependent progressive process. So with modeling, you can look at multiple things at once and predict what's going to happen in an individual patient. Is their response normal or not? Is the outcome as uh, normal or not? and it provides guidance for individuals rather than populations. We need this, and we need it now. So I've put together a summary of this, and there's 13 differences between the germ theory, which is 20th century medicine, and personalized medicine, which should be in the 21st century, except we're already almost 15 years into it and haven't started. So I want the young people to kick in their brain power and start moving forward. So here's a summary, and uh, this was published in Nature Reviews in 2012. Uh, and what we see is that in the 20th century, 
the focus was treating disease. In the 21st century, it should be prevention of disease. In the 20th century, the germ theory emerged because there were compound microscopes developed, so you could actually see the little boogers, and you could uh, culture them and do biopsies and see them in human disease. So this was really an enabling technology. There's new enabling technologies for new paradigm, but they haven't been applied to the new paradigm yet. The theory was a germ theory, and now we're looking at complex risk and variant responses to stress. So in the complex disorders, you do fine until the organ is stressed or injured, and then you have an abnormal series of events that follows in some people. The normal response is inflammation, healing, regeneration. The abnormal response is recurrent acute pancreatitis with fibrosis in some, pain in some, diabetes in some, cancer in some, other dysfunctions in some. That's an abnormal response. The normal one is complete healing. How, who is going to have a variant response that leads to pathology? Well, we want to know, and we know how to figure out the answer and how to begin predicting it. And so the education has to be different. The scientific focus is different. The approaches are different. The disease classification is different. The disease time frame is not static or cross-sectional. It's not you make a diagnosis and you're done. It's dynamic and longitudinal because we need to manage the disease and prevent the development of complications when a person's having an abnormal response to a normal stressor. The physician focus is different. The way diseases are assessed are different. The treatment is different. The success measures are different. But the utility is now important for managing inflammatory diseases, complex genetics, functional disorders where something's wrong, but if you look at the tissue, it looks normal. So it must be psychological, and cancer control. And so this is the challenge we have. And the exciting thing is the pancreas is so simple that we can solve it. There's only two cell types we have to think about, the Asner cell and the duct cell. And I can't think about them both at the same um, Biliary, where you take the gallbladder out, is lower. And then idiopathic and others, which is probably genetic, is somewhere in between. So depending on what the etiology is, the risk of recurrent acute pancreatitis is, uh, is staggered. Now the question is, does recurrent acute pancreatitis, is it important in developing chronic pancreatitis or not? And the answer is, it's extremely important. Your risk of developing chronic pancreatitis after the episode of acute pancreatitis is five times higher if you have recurrent than if you don't. And so the SAPE hypothesis, where you have acute, recurrent acute fibrosis, turns out to be very important. And looking at uh, several thousand patients in our North American pancreatitis study, it turns out that three quarters of them have had recurrent acute pancreatitis before developing chronic pancreatitis. And so we see that that's holding true as well. Now, where does the recurrence come from? And what we're learning is that the normal process is that uh, the pancreas is stimulated. The islet, or excuse me, the Asner cells with the zymogen granules release the uh, pre-activated enzymes, zymogens, into the duct, and then the duct washes them out into the intestine where trypsin is activated. Anywhere along this line, between here and here, there can be a problem that will lead to premature trypsin activation, injury, and acute pancreatitis event. And what we have learned is that there are problems that can happen inside the acinus, usually related to calcium dysregulation and alcohol, or mutations in trypsin itself that are involved in, in, uh, in this process. But there's also a variety of, of risk factors that are completely different that tell us it's in the duct cell. The most important one is CFTR, and then there are a variety of other things that are related to the duct that may be important in causing acute pancreatitis. But today, I'm just going to focus on this molecule, CFTR. Now, what we have been able to do is to start saying, what are the pathways that give you a first hit, a second hit, and then fibrosis? And what I'm going to do is focus on the duct cell and we know there's a lot of things that seem to be important to the duct cell 
later on uh, causing recurrence, and then finally fibrosis. So the CFTR molecule is discovered as the etiologic cause of cystic fibrosis. So this is actually cystic fibrosis of the pancreas. It's not of the lung, it's of the pancreas, because that is the defining uh, process. These uh, people with the severe CFTR develop chronic pancreatitis in infancy. The process of chronic pancreatitis begins in utero about the time that trypsin begins to be expressed in the pancreas. They have elevated sweat chloride and progressive lung disease and sinusitis. Other features, they have meconium ileus because CFTR is important for fluid secretion in the intestine, male infertility. In severe case, they have congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens, or CBAVD, but uh, it turns out it's important for, um, for uh, fertility for other reasons, and there can be liver disease as well. So the mutation is in CFTR. This is a model of what CFTR is with 12 transmembrane uh, spanning domains, some uh, binding, nucleotide binding regions that are important, regulatory regions, and it makes an anion channel. What we, would, we have just described is something very interesting because there's a new bicarbonate-only conductance-disrupting variant that we identified that seems to be associated with pancreatitis, male infertility, and chronic sinusitis, and uh, it was first reported in 2011, and we have some follow-up data as well. So this is a schematic of the epithelial duct cell. Here is the lumen of the duct here. The zymogen granules are coming down from the acinar cells. And here's CFTR, and what we predict is it's secreting the bicarbonate. Now there's another molecule here, SLC26A6, which is a, a chloride bicarbonate exchanger, and the old model, <coughs> Uh, was that uh, chloride would come out of the CFTR and then come back in again, cycling with a perpetual motion machine and pumping bicarbonate out through this mechanism. Uh, through some mathematical modeling that I did on a graphing pocket calculator back in uh, 1999, I just felt that that could not, have, could not be correct and uh, we came up with this model, which we've been testing for the last decade. Other important features is that there are protease-activated receptors, calcium-sensing receptors, other things to detect uh, pathology developing inside of the lumen, and these are linked to CFTR, which causes bicarbonate secretion, and it's flushed out. The other interesting finding is that there are tight junctions here, but if there's insertion of Claudin-2 with activation of these cells, then instead of having complete impermeability, there are channels that are formed that only allow sodium and water to come through, but they do not allow bicarbonate or chloride to come out. So that allows the hypertonicity of, um, of uh, the bicarbonate secretion to draw the sodium in by osmosis, by a, electrical charge and water follows by osmosis, you end up increasing the fluid volume inside a cul-de-sac, and there's only one direction to go, and that's to the duodenum, and that's how you get secretions. Now, the reason this model is important is that we predicted if you have mutations that only affect CFTR bicarbonate secretion, then you have a problem because we also predicted you can't get chloride in on the base lateral surface, and if you can't get bicarbonate out, there's no net flux. Because what we're interested is in flux of ions all the way across the epithelial cell. If you had chloride coming in, this would act as a chloride channel. The issue here is not what's the greatest permeability, it's what is the disequilibrium, and if you're bringing bicarbonate in, then you can have a disequilibrium to push the bicarbonate into the duct in a very high concentration. Peter can tell you, Hagee can tell you the details. So this is what the model looks like. This is CFTR inside and outside. It's an anion channel. It's located on the apical, apical membrane, and you can see how it fits into the plasma membrane. This is uh, outside here, and this is the inside where the nucleotide binding domains and regulatory domains are. 
and it's a regulated ion transporter. And what we recognized is that when people measured the relative permeability of CFTR between chloride and bicarbonate, it was five to one. It was two to one. No, it was three to one. No, it was five to one. Well, what it told us is that it was actually regulated. It wasn't fixed, and therefore, there had to be a regulatory mechanism. So we thought that there was conformational changes that were important. So this is what the chloride, uh, what the channel looks like. You can see the uh, two halves, one in light blue and one in black, and uh, bicarbonate and chloride have to go through that uh, pore in order for it to be secreted. So what we did is we took our registry and we uh, picked out 984 cases that had been uh, phenotyped for all uh, 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 phenotypic features of cystic fibrosis, including sinusitis, lung disease, sweat chlorides, whatever they had. Then we picked out uh, uh, 81 CFTR variants. And the reason these were picked out are these were all the variants that had ever been described more than once in patients with pancreatitis worldwide because it gave us a high pretest probability that if we found something, it would be a replication. It would be the third or fourth time we found it. So that increased the probability that we had a, a true positive. We screened our patients. We found 43 variants. And amazingly, what we found was that, well, not amazingly, if you have uh, the F508 delete, highly associated with pancreatitis, and if it's combined in a transhatozygos with the N34S mutation, very high risk. But what was fascinating is that these mutations that we thought were um, bicarbonate defective, huge effect with SPINK and some effect independently um, as a, a heterozygous or, a hetero or compound heterozygous um, variant. And so it looked like there was a strong effect. What we needed to do is to find out how this actually worked. And so um, we contacted uh, Mingu Lee uh, group, and, I, and he may be here, uh, but uh, they have a cell system that's very good at measuring bicarbonate uh, permeability and found that there's a sensor inside of the cell called WINK1, and when it's activated, it actually causes the switch from a chloride channel to a bicarbonate channel. So they were doing gene bashing, tried to find the gene, and what we did is we said, hey, we got nine of them. We'd like to test them. And he said, sure, yeah, we're going to, we'll test it. We'll, we'll get around to it. I kept emailing him. Finally, I took advantage of my brother, who is an airplane pilot who was doing uh, some uh, consulting work for, uh, for Boeing, uh, teaching the uh, Korean pilots uh, how to take off and land the airplanes and doing their their stuff, and he was in Incheon, so uh, I was going to stop there, and I, I told uh, Mingu, I said, I'm stopping by, and I'd like to look at our collaboration and see how you're coming. So I gave him a three-month advance notice that I was coming for a visit, and he quickly took his graduate students, which are like pawns in a chess game, for those of you who are graduate students, and put them on this project, and what they did is they took each of the mutations did site-directed mutagenesis to put the mutation that I suggested into the CFTR, expressed it in, these, uh, in the, uh, uh, the cells, and tested both for chloride and bicarbonate conductance with or without stimulation. And he uh, finished the analysis the day I got there, and he was shocked. He didn't know what to do. It turned out all my predictions were right. And they, and they spent all this time trying to figure this out. Here we solved the problem. And uh, what, we, what he found was that in both permeability and conductance, if you put the WINK1 in, the ratio of bicarbonate to chloride changes. So it dramatically increases in bicarbonate conductance unless you have these common variants, and then it doesn't. We also put in the M470V, which did nothing. Likewise, for uh, both permeability and conductance, it turned out our variants just didn't respond to activation. 
The problem is they're scattered out through the entire gene, and you can't figure out where it comes from. It looks totally random. But when you solve the problem of where they are in the protein chain and fold it all together, it turns out that uh, there is very clear um, pattern. The first one is that the channel ends up having mutations that put amino acid side chains in that clog the channel up so that only chloride, not bicarbonate, can get through. More interestingly is in, there's a hinge region between the nucleotide binding domains and the other mutations made it stiff so that the molecule could not change with wink activation and was stuck in the, uh, cl the uh, chloride conductance model. So we said, well, that sounds very good and could get pancreatitis, but there are other organs that use CFTR for bicarbonate conductance instead of just um, uh, chloride conductance. And it turns out that the sinuses use uh, CFTR to secrete bicarbonate because it hydrates mucus. Mucus, if you put it in water, is very thick and tenacious. If you add bicarbonate, then it unravels and unfolds. And uh, so we checked, and it turns out that if you have these cystic fibrosis and um, bicarbonate defects, you had a highly significant association with these diseases, but not with other uh, uh, patients with chronic pancreatitis that uh, did not have these mutations. Male infertility was even more shocking because we asked men over age 30 if they've tried for more than a year uh, to, uh, to uh, have a pregnant or to uh, father a pregnancy, and um, nine of them said no, or that they were unable, they were infertile. And it turns out that all of them but one ended up having this bicarbonate defective mutation, either as a as two bicarbonate defective or a severe CFTR and a bicarbonate. And uh, I thought the p-value was pretty good, uh, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 7th. The odds ratio is not 3. The odds ratio is 300. It's a huge odds ratio, and that's because we found the etiology of this particular thing. And so these types of evidence are compelling proof. The final thing we did is we took the CFTR molecule, or Mingu Lee did, and got bicarbonate secretion and then used a, a, a CFTR specific blocking agent and that completely stopped bicarbonate secretion. And that tells us that CFTR conducts bicarbonate and that there are a group of mutations that specifically disrupt bicarbonate conductance and therefore target the pancreas, the male reproductive system, and the sinuses, but not the lungs, the sweat, and the other organs that use CFTR to conduct uh, chloride. We also know that pancreatic divism is associated with CFTR variants. Uh, it's not everything that's associated with uh, pancreatic divism. And here you have a problem where you have distal resistance, but with a CFTR variant, you have an upstream failure to generate uh, high hydrostatic pressure. And so you have a, a weak pump and a high resistance, and it puts you at risk. Smoking also seems to be important. It turns out that smoking will reduce uh, CFTR function, but that alone is not enough. But if you have smoking and a mutation, uh, that seems to put you at risk as well. So there's at least five mechanisms that will affect your pancreas with CFTR. The first one is if you have two severe mutations, you have cystic fibrosis of the pancreas, and all organs, whether they secrete bicarbonate or chloride, are affected. Secondly, you have mild variable ones. This is atypical cystic fibrosis. These are disease, a variety of uh, organs are affected to different amounts. The bicarbonate defective variants, you end up with uh, idio what was used to be idiopathic chronic pancreatitis, male infertility and sinusitis. Um, if you have a CFTR and spink, you end up with idiopathic uh, chronic pancreatitis only, or it's in that group of patients and then uh, smoking, does that lead to chronic pancreatitis? And that's still open for debate. So in conclusion, chronic pancreatitis is the end of a sequence of events that leads to irreversible organ damage. 
The irreversible organ damage is not the diagnosis. That's the bad outcome. The diagnosis is a dysfunction in one of the molecules that has a genetic cause. So susceptibility to, to chronic pancreatitis reflects a lowered threshold of pancreatic injury, but there's multiple sites in which this can happen. CFTR variants are the most important risk factor for pancreatitis that we know of in the pancreatic duct cells, and CFTR variants affecting bicarbonate secretion lead to recurrent acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, sinusitis, and male infertility. And so this was part of our group at the University of Pittsburgh that works night and day to help our patients by doing innovative research, and this backed by the North American Pancreatitis Study Group. We actually have 33 centers that have been working for more than a dozen years in order to collect and carefully phenotype these uh, patients, and we have many collaborators that have helped us as well. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Impressive talk. We're a little bit out of time, so unfortunately we, we have uh, just we have time only for one short question right now. Peter. So I have a question, of course, for CFT. I know is very important. That's. Is uh, it seems no more than likely that all of the pancreatitis inducing factors are really, really strong CFTR inhibitors. So, do you believe that there is any therapeutic possibilities there? Or the second question is about we know that in the bicarbonate secretion, also the anion exchangers are involved. Later, the anion exchanger, the SSC26 family, it's important or not important? Well, we, we, um, Based on mathematical modeling, uh, the exchangers are not important in active uh, bicarbonate secretion. And in fact, if, if you model your system so that bicarbonate can come through CFTR, then the, the, uh, uh, the exchangers run backwards. They're actually counterproductive. Um, what uh, Mingu Lee showed is that uh, when Wink is in is uh, activated, not only does it change CFTR to be a bicarbonate conducting, but actually inhibits the action of the, uh, the ion exchangers. Where they're important is when CFTR is closed, because what it allows is the chloride to re-equilibrate across the apical membrane to bring the chloride concentrations inside the cell back up to baseline levels, which is important for priming the system and getting the initial uh, um, ion uh, movement going. So uh, the, the uh, other point that you put up is there's a number of other factors that uh, are important, and the genetics doesn't tell you if it's important or not. It only tells you something about it if there are disruptive mutations that are common in the population. If there's no mutations in the population, you'll never detect it but it doesn't mean it's not important. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do. It's not about the mutation, it's about that the, the uh, smoking, smoke extracts or ethanol or bilateries are inhibiting the CFTR. So it's not about the genetic question, it's about that in the pathogenesis, yep. the initiation of pancreatitis, CFTR is really important. So can you see any chance of, uh, of maybe the potentiators, correctors to, to have in the initiation phase? So I have two comments on that. The first thing is that if they completely shut off CFTR, 70% of Germany would have chronic pancreatitis because of smoking and drinking. Um, that's what, what, uh, what Heiko told me. Um, so it's not sufficient. Uh, the, the second thing is that we do have potentiators that can improve the opening if it's localized in the right location and if you have unlimited amount of cash, because they're very expensive. And so probably the best thing to do is that if you have a CFTR variant or another mutation that puts you at risk, 
the smoking and drinking adds to the risk and then uh, probably, or may be sufficient. So um, that's sort of how we're looking at it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my perspective. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, so, so um, for this study, we looked at uh, people with a European ancestry to minimize the heterogeneity. But, uh, and that really reflects most of the patients in our clinical practice. So we have about 7% African American and 1% to 2% Asian in our centers. So those are put into a larger evaluation, but uh, I think what Heiko said is exactly right. When you're looking at those patients, you better match them with the, uh, the population that they came from, because otherwise you get spurious results. <laughs>